Mr. Chavla is currently serving as the Chief Knowledge Officer and a Technical Advisor on Digital Technology for the Ministry of Agriculture, Government of India. Um, he retired as the additional Chief Secretary of E-Governance and Department of Administrative Reforms uh, from the state of Karnataka, where you all are right now. He spends a lot of time in Bangalore, so for many of you uh, who are looking forward to further interactions, uh, this is a bit of a jackpot. Um, Mr. Chavlas has won a number of national and international awards uh, for his consistent work on introducing digital technology and electronic governance in the implementation of various schemes, rights, services, and institutions, and the functioning of institutions. Uh, one of his most pioneering projects, which I, I for one know that many states in the country are also looking at learning from, uh, and there are many countries also in the world who are uh, also possibly looking for, looking from to learn for, is this the digitization of the rural land record system called Bhumi. Um, uh, Mr. Chavla has been uh, centrally involved in the conception and design of the e-governance revolution from the point of view of a state at a time at a time and a period when people were just even grappling with the basic vocabulary of it i mean now there are so many of us who talk about all kinds of things and are very familiar with the language and possibilities but mr chavla was involved in driving some of these initiatives when none of us even were really talking about what it could even look like um we have had the privilege of uh, working with Mr. Chavla, of having the opportunity of working with Mr. Chavla. And I know that we as uh, many civil society organizations, many of us really have deep admiration uh, for him, for his capabilities of trying to see how digital technology can fit into very complex governance questions, but also having uh, also recognizing the limitations of digital technology alone and constantly looking at technology through the lens of democratic governance. Uh, we are looking forward to hearing um, the insights of Mr. Chavla and it is, uh, you know, the uh, conversation about commons uh, from the point of view of natural resources is something that's far more intuitive to us like jal, jungle, zameen, water, oceans. Uh, we do have an understanding of how to curate that conversation and thinking around commons. But for digital technology, even the thinking is something that has to now be explored. And this lecture and the series of dialogues that will happen after are a process of that exploration. We are looking forward to hearing from him uh, about his take on what uh, on how digital technology can even be recognized as a common resource. Can it be recognized? Should it be recognized? What comes uh, with that recognition of, should, if you see that as a common resource that everyone should have access to? And also maybe on what digital technology can itself do for strengthening accountability of the commons, which are of all other kinds. Um, so handing this over to Mr. Chavla, a very daunting task. We're all looking forward uh, to hearing from you, sir. Thanks, Rakshita. Uh, I request you to... Yeah, so Kush will be uh, sharing the presentation. So, he yeah. so thanks all of you. I am told you are 10 of you and uh, yeah, very interesting subject to discuss. Uh, so I have just eight, nine slides. It should not take more than 40, 45 minutes. And then, of course, we can discuss for some time. I remember that when we did this Bhumi project in 1998, of course, you had things like Window 98, it had just 97 or 98, I don't even remember. And then, of course, there was something called Window NT, all vintage. Window NT was the server operating system. NT stood for new technology. It was actually a surprise for political leaders, citizens and farmers, everybody. They, they did not know. I mean, I popularly, even now it is said that there were no antibodies against the system. It was such a new thing. People did not know how to react. All of a sudden, uh, 200 lakh property records in Karnataka uh, owned by around 65-70 lakh farmers were already over, over 
all of a sudden translated into a digital system. Farmers didn't know how to react. I remember from day one, we brought fingerprint authentication because we knew password systems would not work. Fingerprint for employees. And the fingerprint system in those years came from US because there was no concept of, there was only one company which was making fingerprint systems. And it was integrated in some laptops at the operating system level. So many channels, BBCs and what not wrote about land records. Now, imagine that was the way just 25 years back. It was exciting because nobody, it was such a new thing. People did not know what was computer. And today, you come to 2022, and every citizen, and why should I waste time on this? So surprising, you go anywhere. Nobody's talking to anybody. They are all busy within themselves. The rural areas also. Everybody is busy. And I remember I got the inaugural Prime Minister Award for Excellence in 2006. The first award Mr. Manmohan Singh gave for digitization of an e-governance project. Next slide. And now none of these awards are given for e-governance projects. Of course, sometimes they're given. Now what I'm trying to say, I'm saying it has become the run of the mill. People use e-governance so heavily, people use IT so heavily. In professional life also we have seen when um, all this COVID happened, people just switched off, switched over to work from home. They had VPNs so that everything is safe. Video conferencing was used heavily. Uh, even this room uh, when it started, people use about password, etc saying anybody can connect, that's the one part, but I'm saying things became so popular. So everybody had broadband, video conference, etc. And then of course, all this home delivery now to be all know this. So in a way, whether we like or not, digital technology has penetrated into our life. We just cannot run away from this, cannot run away. There's no way you can wriggle out of this. Next slide. Now, while one can talk about role of digital technology in various domains, I'll confine, on, confine only to governance. Now, when in 1998, Bhumi was a solitary example, I'll tell you what has changed and it has become so pervasive that you have and I'm giving you examples from Karnataka for two reasons. Number one, you are in Bangalore. And number two, I know a little more about Karnataka than other places. Of course, I know about the whole nation, but I in-depth information about Karnataka is there with me. So you have, I'm sorry, this is not 100, this is 700. Seva Sindhu, which has 700 services. It got the Prime Minister's Award. So just before retirement, I got the second award, thankfully for e-governance again. Seva Sindhu is a collection of 700 services. G2C is not G2G, I'm sorry for the typo, and G2B. Then you have various other applications, systems, social security benefits. Have the first was services, car certificate, income certificate, gun license. The second part is benefits. So now in 48 hours, they use electronic system to verify you. I will not go into that as to where do they get database, how do they verify. We have something called Kutumba, which you can read separately. And then, of course, Aadhaar-driven transport services. In a couple of states, it has been started. You don't need to go to RTO office. You can digitally sign. You can upload EK, I mean, not upload. You can push EKYC data of yours by using Aadhaar EKYC and details can be electronically signed, e-sign and sent. And you can actually therefore do transport services remotely in a contactless, paperless manner. Registration of property from anywhere. So this happened 15 years back, imagine, in the year 2008 or 9. 
that you can register your property in Bangalore from any sub registrar office. You need not go to a particular sub registrar office. Scholarship for people like all of you, about 50, 60 lakh children get scholarship in a paperless, contactless manner. You just give your Aadhaar number and sign using Aadhaar. All your details are picked up from the database. You don't have to upload any document. The government knows about you. The government knows in which school you were. The government knows because it's all linked to Aadhaar. We know your PUC detail. We know your date of birth, etc. Public distribution system, you have heard. We have reached a stage where one nation, one card. You can just go to any state and take your ration. Open network on digital commerce is known to you. You, you are all very active young people. You know about ONDC, how in next two, three years it will happen. And today I am sure some of you would have seen the Supreme Court live streaming also. And legislature live streaming is very common. So that's the way uh, as far as citizen-centric services are concerned. Next slide, please. And then you have government to business. So you have e-procurement platform. So all procurements are done electronically. You have MCA 21 where you register and the companies electronically in half an hour, one hour. You have GEM where all electronic procurement and government of India takes place through the electronic marketplace. GST and you're aware. And then of course, ease of doing business. All services have become electronic, all services. Then you have government to government. You have adoption of e-office across country. Everywhere electronic office. So you have no physical files anymore. You have connected, connecting courts to government. So the courts are now connected to government. That means the data between government and courts. And once you pass out and you continue to work in that sector where you are, you will find that the courts are now completely connected to government. So no case records come physically. We send data electronically, digitally signed. And then, of course, you have wide area networks, data centers, etc. You have PFMS for transfer of funds. You have HRMS for payment of salary to employees digitally. And then all the states have electronic traceries. So imagine the quantum of pervasiveness of the digital technology into the life of... After all, when you talk about government of government, there are citizens involved. Government to business, they are also citizens. It's all citizens. You cannot wriggle out of the electronic system, the digital system. Next slide, please. And therefore, whether you like it or not, now that digital technology has virtually become part of citizen's life, it needs to be considered as common. And all citizens should have right to use. It's our responsibility the government responsibility to ensure that everybody has a right to use. We should facilitate that. It's a common resource, not meant for some people. Next slide. Now, what are the challenges which we are facing? We means the citizen. You have a problem of literacy. And actually, those who need digital technology the most are not aware of how to use it. And it's very unfortunate. No? Those who are poor people who have to apply for scholarship don't know how to apply electronically. So unfortunate. So you say the poorest of poor should get, but I can show you uh, through the databases that those who are applying are actually much above in the strata than those who never knew that they had to apply. And then, of course, literacy problem in even rich sections of the society. You go and see in how many houses, how many women will not be interested. They don't know how to do UPI. They don't know how to do Paytm. They make mistakes. They're always threatened as to what would happen. And then, of course, disabled people. So what have we done for them? What type of systems are we creating for them? And then a connected issue comes. People are worried about that also. They say digital technology, but there's a threat of privacy. Government is collecting huge data. And I must tell you, some of you would have read the Andhra experiment, where a huge database of citizens 
uh, created by this Chandra Babu Naidu during the election time was leaked, not leaked, given to the political party. And then, of course, it was used for political purpose. FIRs were lost. Take another example that if you have a land record database, it is also very easy to pick up your political opponents from there and find out how many lands they are holding. Of course, they would be smart. Many of them would not have their in their own name, but I'm sure uh, other parties are also smart. They can find out how they are related, bog bogus names, etc. All that can be found. How land record system digitization, Rakshita has made life bad, PAD bad. You should read in a case study by Benjamin Solomon. He has written about Bhumi. And he has written about socioeconomic quality problems associated with Bhumi. He says that any case study should not just look at the technical part. And he says, in his view, and there are views of this type, that perhaps the work of land records was a retrograde step from the point of view of the political economy which runs. And you should read very interesting paper. I mean, the more I read now, I understand that this man wrote about this about 15, 20 years back. And he was on the dot. And I think we should learn from what he said. We should go ahead, but we should make it better. We have also heard about telecom data. Everything can be found about you. I mean, there are very good articles written as to how you can triangulate data, find out who is with whom and spoil their married life and things like this. So all these are the negative parts of the digital technology. All these problems need to be handled. The fact is so pervasive. You need to handle this. You cannot run away. You cannot say this is not a common resource. It is. But is it harming people? How do we make it a more useful resource? And how do we ensure that everybody gets that resource? Well, that's the idea. And I come to the last slide, I think. Next slide, please. Huh. Two, three more points. Now, this data enables surveillance. Now, this is very dangerous. Now, you have very smart digital tools which can de-anonymize the anonymized data. So if I give you anonymized data on COVID and you start de-anonymizing, I mean, they are so simple things. If I say there is a man who is of 50 years who lives in White House apartment and uh, his height is 5 foot 6 inches, that's it. You don't need to know. I mean, in 1,000 houses, you can find out who is that person. And then there are tools to be anonymized data. So therefore, tools are becoming faster. So you will have this data enabled, enabled surveillance. You have a surveillance problem on people. You know, it hurts people. It is very easy to say, come on, this is all theoretical. When it comes on you, then you come to me. But using data, how much can be known about me? It's a problem with common resource. Why should I use digital technology? Is it meant for me? It is going to hurt me. And then, of course, issue of affordability of hardware tools, very various machines, etc., mobile phones, routers at home, bandwidth, network provisioning. Karnataka, out of 30,000 villages, has about 28,000 villages where you have 3G connection. But there are many states where you have no networks. And then this new corruption has come, and I'm sure Rakshita would know much more. These new languages are emerging now. Server down, Ekalana. Nobody knows what is server down. A farmer does not even understand what is server. I don't know. He understands nothing about down. Server down. Patani down kya hota hai? English like to ye. Or server down kaise hota hai? Down matlab gir gaya kya niche. And then software mein bug hai. Just, just say that. You don't have to care for anybody. And then passwords are misused by data entry operators and you do corruption. You know, you, Because after all, the officers don't have passwords. They give it to their operators because the systems are designed like this. So you 
in a common resource, you have this limitation. Do you run away from that resource? The answer is big no. So how do you handle these problems? Of course, I don't have answers to everything. You people have to answer. But I must tell you that there is a lack of political and administrative will. When we work, now, we are working in spite of this will. And in spite doesn't help. You see, when UPI had to happen or something, when there was a political push at the highest level, things happen. But at the state level where the services are, I have hardly seen political leaders who are talking in favor of the work to be done. And then, of course, administrators like us, they say, IT is not my job. Come on. So you are defeated in the beginning itself. You have a feeling that you are defeated. When you have a feeling that you are defeated, then you are defeated anyway. You say, I don't know. I'm not an engineer. I Chavla is an engineer. I don't understand whatever we spoke till now. What engineering is involved in this? There's absolutely no engineering. But then you don't have will. And devil lies in detail. So you never care about people. You never care about system. You don't even see. You don't even see the screens. You don't even see whether they are in colloquial language or English. You don't even see as to the labels. Do they make sense to common people? I mean, you have to, you have to see what citizen will understand, not your official language. And then no grievance management system. So if anybody has a problem, server down, that somebody should be able to tell somebody. No? So that we do an analysis of the log and find out whether the server was actually down at that time or not. So you have, I mean, unless we in the government, and I'm only talking about governance, I'm not talking about private sector and others. I'm only talking about government. He, if we don't have a will, we means the government, then how, how can we help him? So you have, I mean, if you see all these three points, with my experience of 37, 38 years, I am very, very clear in my mind that these are the serious problems. They all emanate out of point number one. That I don't have a will to do. I am doing because perhaps I am doing, somebody is telling me to do. CM says you have to do something. Come on, that's not the way. Why should CM tell you? It is your job to do. There's a basic problem in the government. Next slide. And then, of course, this is the last slide. So, when somebody says server down and you come to know, what do you do with that first? It's all petty corruption. This is nothing else. It's only harassment to that person. On the other side, you can do proactive things. Because right to data, the digital technology cannot be without digital data as a common resource. You cannot say tech. What is technology? Yeah? I mean, if you really see the expanded definition of technology, it includes digital data. What is technology without data? So then you should have uh, proactive disclosures. We have Mahidi Kanaja in Karnataka. You should disclose data. Why should BBMP, for example, not disclose this data? That itself will motivate people to learn more digitally. They'll find out what is happening in governance around it. So when we did Mahiti Kanaja, now about 50, 60,000 people access it on a daily basis because there's the data of the rural areas. Previous slide, please. There's the data of the rural people. Panchayat. So you should have Mahiti Kanaja. Who is getting fair price? Who is getting ration? Is he really poor? Who is getting PM Kisan? Is he really holding land? After all, if money is given, money is not a common risk. To give it to somebody, the other will not get it. Therefore, you have a right to see what is happening. And then we should all think that we are selling our IT systems. We should popularize them. We cannot say we are government and therefore that's not the way. So we should have digital literacy, especially optimized for e-governance system. And then, of course, local language. How many of our websites will only be in English? And then mobile-first technology. 
and if no smartphone available, the normal phones also should work. And I'm now working on a project called AgriStack, which is making digital services available to farmers, 14 crore farmers. And I think whatever I have said are all applicable to me. You point out one finger at others, four fingers glare at you. And therefore, all these lessons are for me. That look, when you design system, think that if your father, who was a farmer, was to look at it, will he understand all this? Or are you going to trouble him again? And they again get excluded from agriculture. Because only powerful people will be able to exploit the power of IT and therefore gain at the cost of others. So this is all Rakshita I had to say, and I would be uh, open to some issues or questions which are raised, Rakshita. Thank you, sir. Can I also just request, I know it's not part of your slides, but I know that we would uh, all really learn a lot from your, just a bit of a description, sir, because two projects that you are, that one is Bhumi, which a land, I mean, as a common resource as a land when digital technology was applied to it for its governance. And now when you talk about agriculture, so for instance, for farmers, soil, uh, because in our previous lectures, we even looked at food security as a common resource, soil and biodiversity as seeds as a common resource. So just if you can even explain to the students, for instance, how digital technology is being used for AgriStack and how is it being even imagined for a common resource, just, just for their information. And I think that will set off some questions. Right. So in AgriStack, the idea was that Government cannot do everything. Government cannot reach out to 14 crore farmers, number one. Number two, without using technology, you cannot. You means not only government, even the private sector, nobody can help farmers. How do you say that? Obviously, uh, it's only the satellite data. I mean, you cannot go to every site. You cannot go to every place and see when it would rain, why should I give irrigation when it is going to rain shortly? Are you aware it is going to rain? Of course I'm aware it's going to rain. The machines tell me it's going to rain at least 48 hours with reasonable certainty I come to know. Is pesticides is going to occur? Of course we reasonably know that pesticides is going to occur. Today in grapes, we can tell you under what circumstances pest comes. How do we know those sectors? So can't we have electronic information getting fed into a modeling tool? Uh, and lots of AI people like Badwanis, for example, are working on tools where they can predict when a pest would come. And you just give a photo of a leaf and the system tells you immediately, immediately on the fly in real time that a pest has come and which pest it is. These are these are things which are already working. Drones can now pick up enough information, and I can tell you some organizations, startups who are working on this, where they fly over the land, they can see the moisture in the crop, they can see the uh, soil health, they can see the see the crop health and advise you. All this requires digital data. It requires, for example, if Rajiv Chawla wants advice, where is his land? Because only then satellite data can sit on the top of it. So I need longitude, latitude of his plot so that he can give those details to the, of course, with the consent. And then the satellite data can sit on the top because it has to be referenced to that point. And then tools can run on the top of it. So the work in AgriStack is that we facilitate those critical data, like who are the farmers, how many lands they are owning, where is the land, and then what grow of crops they are growing. If I can tell this much dynamically to private sector organizations, then private sector organizations would be able to advise farmers. What? And now you come to common resource. Don't put more water. Please put water only in this part of the land. Plot. 
a part of this plot. Now you are saving water, you are saving crop. Put only this much of fertilizer, put only this much of pesticide. Now you are saving soil. So I feel, I mean, with my limited experience, of course, I'm not an agriculture domain expert, but I can tell you that the electronic services would actually preserve common resources, namely soil and water. And agriculture consumes huge water. I am told per gram of a cereal, how much of liters it consumes. I mean, there are numbers you can read. If you have to produce some 100 grams of some pulses, how much water it requires. Can I reduce it by 50%? You should read, there are wonderful videos on the internet which would tell how you can digitally see uh, when you need to leave it instead of just throwing water there. So I am sure that digital agriculture is a huge project. It affects 15 crore farmers directly and 140 crores of people like us. How much of pesticide we are consuming? Because we don't know. Just go to uh, Maharashtra and see how grapes farmers are making use of digital agriculture. Should go and see to understand. So that is one area where some work will happen in next two, three years.